G'day, mate. Forty here. So my friend uh, Ricardo had an interesting tweet today. He said, uh, "I've come back around on Richard. Not sure I ever really left. Truly, the greatest pundit of his generation." So uh, Ricardo famously had to leave the house when he he wanted to go interview uh, Richard Spencer because it, it created uh, that much conflict. So I I get this assessment. I mean, Richard Spencer is an entertaining, compelling figure. Like, people like Richard Spencer, people like J.F. Garupi, people like Dennis Prager, Tucker Carlson, Sean Hannity, uh, Jordan Peterson, they have a certain gravitas, they have a certain presence that just does, you know, compels your attention. They change the molecules of the air around you when they, they walk into the same room as you. But uh, so many things to analyze in this statement. So number one, uh, what type of person comes up with a list or a, a designation of the greatest pundit of his generation, right? Only someone with a way above average level of interest in politics. So let's say you were a pundit who fundamentally believed that we had skies of blue, trees of green, We had dogs wagging their tails that uh, overall politics for 99% of people, 99% of the time is not important. Okay, but a pundit with that fundamental worldview who looked around and said, what a beautiful world we live in. What a beautiful country we live in. What a beautiful community I live in. I am so grateful to live in Los Angeles or Charlottesville or... New York City or Chicago or Seattle or some small town in Florida. I am so grateful for the opportunities that I have as an American. I am so grateful for my government and for the way it did an above average job dealing with with COVID. That person is not going to attract a a rabid following because the type of person who has a rabid interest in politics, like I do and like Ricardo does, it wants to hear something exciting, wants to hear descriptions of reality that he himself cannot see. Right? That's the motivation for the pundit, is to paint pictures that you cannot see on your own. The prime motivation, the best way of understanding punditry is to understand that the primary incentive that the pundit faces is to increase his own importance. And the primary way of increasing your own importance is, one, to do something that you know, many people can do, which is to tell people what they want to hear. But really, the best way, the most effective way for increasing your status as a pundit is to paint pictures of things that ordinary people can't see. So you go like Dennis Prager and you say, we're living in 1930s Germany. We're living in Russia just right before or right after the communist takeover. That uh, we're living through a civil war, right? Pundits are known for their hyperbolic pronunciations. When you listen to Richard Spencer, you'll get a lot of you know hyperbolic pronunciations about things that you just don't see in reality. And it's so compelling, it's so you know fun to listen to Richard Spencer because he is painting often these detailed compelling, you know, attention-grabbing descriptions of the world around you that you just don't recognize, that you don't see. But if you listen to Richard Spencer, then you get to see the unseen, right? He has taken on, the the pundit has taken on the role that used to go to clergy, that they would paint, they would make real for you unseen worlds. It used to be unseen worlds of the spirit, unseen worlds of, of God, unseen worlds of religion, unseen worlds of demons and angels, right? That's what, you know, the the charismatic preacher used to give. Now the pundit is giving you unseen worlds that you don't see, that there's a civil war going on around you, that you are living under communist tyranny, all right? Yeah, Richard Spencer blocked me years ago. So a great deal of people who watch this show believe that... uh, they live under communist tyranny in the United States of America. About the freest, most prosperous, most powerful nation the world has ever seen. And yet they choose to believe that they are living under communist tyranny. 
It's just unbelievable. And a pundit who can tap in to that yearning to explain why, you know, someone just goes from serial failure to serial failure. Hey, it's not your fault. It's the, it's the system. It's America. America's, you know, a communist uh, tyranny r- right now. Th- that's why you're having these, these troubles, right? There's an enormous audience for that. But it's, it's mainly the success goes to those who can paint pictures of, of secularized forms of demons and angels and conflicts, you know, metaphysical, physical, psychological, spiritual, philosophical, religious, like Richard is devoting himself to starting a new religion. And so that's exciting. That's compelling. Now, this type of pundit, all right, the, the type of person who's going to appeal to someone who is looking to anoint the greatest pundit of his generation cannot be someone who says, what a beautiful world we live in here in the United States, or you know, what unparalleled prosperity, opportunity, and, and safety is afforded to us in, in the first world today. You know, thank God for the vaccines. Thank God for public health. Thank God for our medical and scientific establishment. Thank God for our, you know, police and, and military. All right? What a beautiful blue sky I'm looking at right now. Look at those trees of green. Think about that fluffy, happy friendly dog that I was playing with earlier today, right? There is, there is no way to rise in status and develop a strong following as a pundit with this idea that uh, <laughs> what a beautiful world we live in. We're, we're so lucky to live in the United States or Australia or France or, or Germany for, for all our problems right now. So that's the, the key to successful punditry paint things that people cannot see. Now, how do you paint things that people cannot see? Right? By telling them things that don't exist. Right? That's the easiest, most effective way of painting things that people cannot see. You tell people a bunch of things that do not exist. So to be a winning pundit, to be a successful pundit, even to reach the level of a JF RP, all right, or a Dennis Prager or a Ben Shapiro, or Richard Spencer, right? You cannot optimize for truth. You cannot make truth your primary objective. To the best of my knowledge, I make truth my primary objective on this show within the confines that I'm not going to blow up my life, right? But I'm willing to make a lot of sacrifices to optimize truth. So if you're going to optimize truth, you will be, in all likelihood, denied status. Yes, I keep telling you, Richard Spencer blocked me many, many years ago, something like uh, 2018. But if you optimize for truth, you're going to be blocked from status. You're going to be blocked from prestige. You're going to be blocked from many sources of income. You're going to be blocked from most forms of success. You are going to be blocked from you know, friendly appearances in the mainstream media. You're going to be blocked from developing a cult following, right? There will be a lot of sacrifices you'll have to make if you choose to optimize for truth. I choose to optimize for truth. I cannot provide you an exciting show like Richard Spencer does because I optimize for truth. Richard Spencer optimizes for grabbing the maximum of attention, right? That is the number one value for Richard Spencer to use his abilities to secure the maximum of attention for Richard Spencer. And he's great at it. He comes from a theatrical background, and he has a compelling theatrical manner. And you will get people like my good friend Ricardo, understandably pronouncing him the greatest pundit of his generation because he is so theatrical. Now, there is a downside to being excessively theatrical like Richard Spencer, and that is truth is not a particularly high value. You cannot maximize for theatricality and attention-seeking like Richard Spencer does and still put a high priority on truth. Right? You, you, you can't reach Ben Shapiro, J.F. Garupi, Dennis Prager levels if you optimize primarily for truth. You have to give up a lot to optimize for truth because a lot of truth is boring, right? So you cannot produce as exciting a a worldview, as exciting a product as those who do not optimize for truth. 
Truth is frequently seemingly contradictory. Truth is complicated, often, and nuanced. Truth is frequently highly sophisticated. Truth will inevitably be unpopular much of the time. Right? You will offend people. You will become isolated if you optimize for truth. There is a tremendous price to be paid for optimizing truth. Right? If you want to succeed as a live streamer in terms of success at making a living, you will have a lot easier time if you maximize for excitement. If you maximize for spectacle, Richard Spencer has constructed his public life to maximize for spectacle, to maximize for constructing essentially an ongoing theatrical performance that is highly tuned to grabbing and sustaining your attention. Now, the only way you can do that is at the price of telling the truth. I'll give you a very boring truth. We get to decide how much violent crime that we have in this country or any country by how much we decide to you know, punish it. Right? If we lock up violent criminals for a long time, we will slash our violent crime rates. Now, for Richard Spencer, this is an exceedingly boring perspective. Right? So reducing tens of thousands of murders a year is just boring. It is not compelling. And so Richard Spencer sees absolutely no value in the Republican Party, even though the Republicans consistently, more than Democrats, want to punish and carry out punishment against violent criminals. But for Richard Spencer, that is not exciting enough to grab and compel and sustain your attention and your donations and your subscriptions. Right? It's such an elementary truth. We get to decide our crime rates by how much we punish people who do violent crime. Right? We can essentially choose how much murder we put up with in our society by choosing how much punishment we dole out to people who commit murder. Such a boring, routine, Republican perspective that Richard Spencer just finds boring. It's not theatrical. It's not, hey, hi, guys. Let me tell you about Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. And let me apply that to Lady Gaga and Kanye West and this great movie I saw last night. Right? It's not theatrical, right? It's just, it's just uh, downbeat. The GOP is increasingly the part of gangster worship. Republicans consistently are more supportive of punishing violent criminals than Democrats. That's just indisputably true, right? Uh, point out to me prominent Democrats who more than the average Republican want to punish violent criminals. Just start reeling off the names. Give me the names of prominent Democrats who more than an average Republican want to punish violent criminals and the, the greatest, the most appropriate punishment for murderers is to execute them. So who are the leading Democrats who are loudly, proudly, publicly, and effectively proclaiming the need for an increased use of capital punishment? You can't name any, all right? Because for all the Republican weaknesses, and no matter how boring the Republicans are, right, Republicans are far more supportive of capital punishment than Democratic politicians. Far more. They are far more in favor of long prison terms for violent criminals than Democratic politicians. But that's boring. That's not exciting and theatrical. It's not, you can't work that into, you know, a, a compelling Richard Spencer monologue. So we, we all have egos and we all seek to maximize our importance. And I'm seeking to maximize my importance right now by proclaiming that I optimize for truth while these other people, they optimize for theatrical performances, right? So Scotty Pippen, remember he was second banana to Michael Jordan on the Chicago Bulls. And when Michael took a break from playing basketball to enter the minor leagues and play baseball, the Chicago Bulls had a very difficult time of it. And in a crucial game, in the crucial last second timeout, all right, where the, the Bulls absolutely needed, I think, something like a, a three-point shot. Uh, this is recounted in The Last Dance, the excellent 10-part Netflix documentary. Uh, the Chicago Bulls coach drew up a play where this European player would get to take the last shot. Scottie Pippen was so offended. He was so miffed. 
that he wouldn't even take the court because he wasn't going to be given the ball. Now, this European guy took the ball, sunk the basket, won the game, got the balls into the playoffs. That didn't matter to Scottie Pippen. He still stands by what he does. He's a classic me-first kind of guy. And pundits, overwhelmingly, are me-first kind of guys. If their success, their income, their status and prestige and their access to you know, attractive young women's you know, vulnerable nether regions comes at the cost of confusing you, comes at the cost of you know, diminishing the, the quality of your life, comes at the cost of conducting effective, you know, campaign of epistemic sabotage. All right. That's that, that doesn't matter to them because they are putting a priority on their own self-importance. So what was the great uh, insight by Richard Spencer that uh, caused Ricardo to you know, wax lyrical about the greatest pundit of our generation? It was Richard saying that uh, Donald Trump should come back and be speaker of the house. Now, Donald Trump would be an absolutely terrible Speaker of the House. Donald Trump is not at all suited for the position of Speaker of the House. But if you're theatrical, right, this is the type of thing that you come out with. Well, well, then Donald Trump should just come out and become Speaker of the House of Representatives. That's the, the path forward for Republicans, right? That's a you know, flaming, theatrical, you know, attention-grabbing, exciting, interesting, compelling presentation that is completely removed from truth, reality. It's just a horrible idea. But hey, it's theatrical. It means more attention for me. And heck, I'm the greatest pundit of my generation. And I've got more theatrical hot takes coming up. And I get to have these theatrical hot takes that will just so compel your attention because I do not optimize for truth and I do not optimize for decency. I do not optimize for goodness. I do not optimize for what's in the best interest of the United States of America or for my particular people. I optimize for me, getting attention for me, for the theatrical expression of my id. That's what I optimize for. So, I mean, this applies just as much to Orthodox rabbis as it does to NBA players and plumbers and pundits and live streamers and attorneys. So after World War II, Yehiel Yaakov Weinberg, perhaps the greatest rabbi in Europe who survived the Holocaust, he was invited to come to Yeshiva University, the flagship modern orthodox university in New York City. And he did not want to come to YU and he didn't want to come to Skokie Yeshiva in Chicago. Why? Because he would not get to be number one there. So Joseph Bear Soloveitchik was number one at YU and Yehiel Yaakov Weinberg had an ego that would not permit him to be number two. And he would not go to Skokie because he would have been number two there. So instead, he stayed in a small town in Switzerland because his ego would not permit him to be number two. And uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, Joseph Bear Soloveitchik, his ego would not have permitted him to be number two. Anyone, he could not have, you know, he could not have uh, handled it. Rupert, throw 40 the damn ball. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, we all tend to maximize for our own importance, and I'm trying to do that right now. I think I'm being explicit. I'm trying to maximize my own importance by saying that I optimize for truth, while these other people maximize for theatrical presentations. I mean, what do you want from a pundit? Right? Overwhelmingly, people do not primarily want truth from a pundit. Overwhelmingly, they want to feel something. They want to feel good, and they want to feel excited. They will love a pundit who can just present the greatest hits. Right? So just like Top 40, how does Top 40 talk radio, uh, Top 40 music radio succeed by playing the hits, the latest greatest hits over and over and over again? So too in talk radio, that's the formula. You play the greatest hits. Talk radio is dominated by the right wing. So you play the greatest hits of conservative thought over and over and over again in every you know, possible situation. You have you know, six to 10 stock perspectives that you just keep offering over and over and over again. You just keep playing the hits. The other alternative, if you don't want to play the hits and Richard Spencer considers himself 
rightly too good for that, is you come up with, you know, unseen and usually worlds that aren't even there, right, that you then paint and describe for people. So just like in an earlier time, preachers and clergy would lay out, you know, tales of demons and angels and heaven and hell and all sorts of unseen worlds where spiritual forces are doing battle, or your, your secular gurus who, who now take on this role, all right, like uh, Richard Spencer, he is doing the, the secular equivalent. He's taking you into this unseen spiritual world where great spiritual forces are, are doing battle, and he's telling you what's really going on. Well, not claiming that either rabbi your name was above such motivations, what evidence do you have that they were primary? Well, just learn about them. Uh, Yehiel Yaakov Weinberg was invited to YU. He was invited to Skokie Yeshiva after World War II. And why did he stay in, in Europe? Why did, he, well, why did he move to a small town in Switzerland? Because he at least got to be number one in that uh, small town. Okay, playing the hits, right? That's that's a surefire way to being more successful as a pundit, talk show host. Uh, essentially, act as a cover band for the best right wing tropes. Just repeat them over and over again. That's what most of right wing talk radio is for. Having a conscience will not serve you if you want to become a champion live streamer, champion pundit, champion talk show host. Because if you want to be a great live streamer, pundit, talk show host, your primary obligation is to put on a great theatrical spectacle, which can only be done at the cost of truth. But you want to optimize for truth, then all sorts of things you'll have to pay for. You'll lose, you'll lose many of your sources of income. You'll lose many opportunities for income. You'll very likely lose your other jobs. You'll lose the possibility of gaining other jobs. You'll lose status you'll lose prestige, you'll lose uh, access to attractive young women, you'll lose your social standing, you'll become alienated from the people who you most want to get close to. You may be a convert to Orthodox Judaism, and you may want a lot of Shabbos invites and holiday invites. Well, if you optimize for truth, you're not going to get a lot of invites because no insular group, an Orthodox Jews are an insular group, you know, primarily optimizes for truth. You do not get to build a high-intensity community optimizing for truth. You build a high-intensity community by optimizing a particular hero system, a particular narrative that involves a great deal of how, you know, your group is oppressed and that your group is, you know, shining the light for the, for the rest of the world. The people that you will love the most will not love you back much of the time, if you optimize for truth. Now, you want to succeed with people, you need to optimize for agreeableness. You want to optimize for making them feel good, right? You want to be liked, then optimize for making other people feel good. Bring a smile to other people's face. Give them that feeling of great, you know, happy, uh, uplifted, right? When they think of you, see you, talk to you, right? That will make you liked. That will make you liked in person. That will make you liked as a public speaker. That will make you liked as a live streamer and a, a pundit and a parasocial personality is if you give people good feelings, if you help them to feel better, all right? If you, you know, unlock their happiness and joy and excitement. But you're not going to be able to do that nearly as effectively if you optimize for truth. For his teeth and appearance are amazing. <laughs> Is it possible that Rabbi Yehiel Yaakov Weinberg might have preferred the climate, the scenery, and other connections to Switzerland? No, it was primarily ego. I mean, read the Mark Shapiro biography of Yehiel Yaakov Weinberg. I'm not criticizing him for it. I mean, everyone has, has an ego. I certainly do. I mean, telling the truth is just not exciting. Right? It's not going to electrify your audience. You're not going to just charge up the, the mountain to high status income and you know, access to young women's bodies by telling the truth. Right? It's akin to, let's say you optimize 
your family, right? You make your family your number one priority, right? You're not going to be, in all likelihood, as exciting a public personality if your number one value is your family. Let's say you optimize for being faithful to your wife, right? There's a lot of excitement that you're going to have to give up. Like, I just can't picture Richard Spencer ever remaining faithful to, to a woman because he would have to stop being Richard Spencer if he was going to be faithful to his woman. Let's say Richard Spencer optimized, he made his family his number one priority. He would be nothing like the Richard Spencer we see right now. Let's say Richard Spencer made his community or the well-being of his people his number one priority. He would have to cease being Richard Spencer. The Richard Spencer we, we see and have enjoyed over the past few years is nothing like a Richard Spencer who makes his number one priority the well-being of his people or of his family or of his community, right? If you choose to be monogamous, right, there's a whole lot of things that you're going to give up. There's a whole lot of excitement that you have to give up. You're going to have to make a lot of dull, dreary choices. You're going to have to turn away from pleasure and excitement and, you know, thrill-seeking. And if, if you want to make your family your number one priority, or if you want to make truth your number one priority. So we get to choose you know, what we optimize for, and we get to choose what type of people we listen to, and we get to choose, are we choosing to listen to people primarily because they are exciting, because they are telling us what we want to hear? Right? Because they are painting unseen worlds that are just so thrilling.